Hello physics students. Welcome to our next topic called Newton's Laws. So at this point we've had two units and I've given you sort of this brief overview already twice explaining the goal of physics. The goal of physics is to understand everything and all time. So as I said the first physics video that when you look at the night sky and you see a little twinkle there, that may be a galaxy, which is billions of stars, billions of suns like ours, stars bigger than our sun. Physicists want to know what's happening all the way there across that enormous distance beyond our imagination. They also want to know what's happening right here on Earth and for even going smaller still to things that are tiny beyond imagination like what's happening inside of an atom, even smaller, what's happening inside of a nucleus, what's happening inside of a proton. Enormous scales and from the Big Bang to maybe the end of time, all that we want to understand. And so what we began with, our first topic, was forces. We started by learning that the universe evolves because of pushes or pulls. And those pushes or pulls could come from obviously living things like us or animals like horses, but they could also come from non-living things, inanimate objects, things with not even a machine but no moving parts like a chair because forces can get things to move or they could keep things at rest. So when I sit in a chair, it's supplying force. And we went further. We quantified force into numerical values mathematically. So we could find Newton's how hard a pull or push is with scales or formulas and then we could find out the net effect of several forces using mathematics like for example the Pythagorean theorem and using a calculator we could find the net force to millions or billions or trillions of a Newton to minuscule amounts we got enormously precise. But then we realized there was a missing piece. There was motion. So we, we knew forces somehow had something to do with motion. We quantified forces. So we had to do the same thing with motion, which is what we did in the last unit. We figured out displacement, velocity, acceleration, formulas for those things. And then we could use, for example, a formula like d equals one half at squared. And we could figure out something accelerating from rest exactly where it is at a certain amount of time. So race car through formulas, we could figure out that it'll be at the finish line at a particular time. So we got very precise mathematically with motion. But here's the thing, we haven't bridged the gap yet. What's the relationship between force and motion? These two very mathematical things that we now have, there is a relationship. If I shove something gently, there's a little bit of motion. If I throw it real hard, there's a lot more motion. So in this unit, we're finally going to put everything together. This is now the moment where all of the physics, the month plus of studying is going to come together and make sense into a cohesive model. So that's what we're doing to beginning today. Very exciting in terms of your understanding of that universe that I talked about. So um, that's the starting point, Newton's laws. Today we're going to actually begin with the first steps that people took to understanding the universe mathematically. The first steps, well let's go back to sometime in the 1500s and 1600s. Back then the understanding was so limited that people didn't even understand that the, or they didn't believe that the earth went around the sun. People thought the sun went around the earth, so very, very much uh, in, in a poor state of understanding. So why would they think such a thing? Well, think about this, all right? So uh, I, let's suppose I'm standing next to this wall right here, and if the earth were truly going around the sun, takes one year to go around a circle. We could actually calculate the speed of the Earth based on the proposed dimensions of the solar system. And so we calculate that and the speed of the Earth right now, I am moving 
about 67,000 miles per hour, including you sitting on your chair or wherever you are watching this video, you're moving around the sun 67,000 miles per hour. Not 100, not 200, right? That'd be fast. An airplane, 500 miles an hour. No, 67,000. So incredibly fast. And then the question is, what keeps me going? Why, for example, when I jump up and land, I'm not jumping up high because I don't want to shake my audio too much, but I jump up and I leave the ground and the wall behind me, which is attached to the school, is moving 67,000 miles an hour. Why doesn't it hit me? Because I'm not rooted to the ground. If I stop, doesn't the wall just slam into me? And we know, first of all, if I got hit by a tractor trailer going 100 miles an hour, right? I'm a goner. Pieces flying off, right? That's just a 100 miles an hour tractor trailer. What about a wall or next to a mountain that's going 67,000, right? So the idea was that we cannot be going around the sun because every time we jumped, we'd be obliterated by anything behind us, okay? And the first person to start to explain that away was a man named Galileo Galilei in the 1600s, okay? So he came up with an idea that reversed a misconception about that example I just gave. So what I'm going to do is raise the screen here and we'll see his radical idea. So let me first pause. Oh, before I pause, this is actually two sentences that Galileo said. One is an object at rest stays at rest unless acted upon, and one is an object in motion stays in motion unless acted upon. I got a little lazy, so I made two sentences like this. So go ahead and jot them down, either as two sentences or like this if you'd like. I'll pause the video now to let you do that. Okay, so what this did is it solved that problem because Galileo says that an object in motion stays in motion without any effect at all unless you stop it, you physically stop it. So if I've got a wall behind me here, 67,000 miles an hour, and I jump, and I'm moving 67,000 miles an hour. If I jump up and, the, and I stop, and the wall keeps moving, it slams into me, right? But if I jump up and I keep moving at 67,000 miles an hour, so I jump up, the wall moves 67, I move 67,000, and then, I land and the wall never struck me because I stayed in motion. And so that was the big piece that Galileo added to allow people to understand, well, how could it be that we're going around the sun like that or any planet? What keeps us moving? Nothing at all, okay? It's our natural tendency. Before then, people thought the natural tendency of things was to always stop the natural state. Everything stops. Galileo flipped around and said, no, it stays in motion, okay? So now, uh, you might think of that as, um, oh, by the way, so that's the Galileo uh, explanation, the reason. Let me just read you a quote from Galileo in case you're writing this down, yawning, thinking this is boring or something like that. This is what Galileo said all the way back in the 1600s about his work on, it, on what we call inertia. Facts which seem improbable will even in scant explanation, drop the cloak which has hidden them and stand forth in naked and simple beauty. So there it is, naked and simple beauty, in case you didn't catch that, okay? So now, so now we know that objects in motion stay in motion unless active. By the way, sometimes you're going to flip, your mind will flip back to the old way, thinking things are naturally stop. And I'll point that out later. In our, so even with Galileo's work, we still go back to the primitive way because our mind sometimes has trouble accepting this. So, but the point is now we know that objects in motion stay in motion because we've seen rockets in outer space. Like for example, when we launched to go to the moon in the 1960s, the rocket thrusters ran for, I forget what it was, a little over 10 minutes. Then they ran out of fuel. The rest of the way, the rocket took days, I think like three days to get to the moon. 
It didn't have the engines running like when you're driving your car down the highway and your engine has to keep pushing. In outer space, the rocket coasts with no fuel at all and gets there days later. To stop it takes force. And that's what Galileo also understood. He understood that the natural state was to stay moving when things stop. It's because something is actually stopping them. And we now know, because of Galileo, it's friction that stops things from naturally moving. So we know this because of space travel. But a very interesting thing to think about is how Galileo knew it. How did he figure this out? Because if you go back in time to the 1600s, and you're standing next to Galileo, you're looking at the world. There's no automobiles, there's no trains, no maglev trains, no rocket ships. All he had around him was horse carriages pulling wagons, pulling them over muddy trails. Even in the cities, the streets were cobblestone, so the wagons sort of shaking over the cobblestone. And as soon as the horse stops pulling the cabin, the, 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 the carriage stops pretty quickly. Launch an arrow. It goes, okay, but then it stops pretty quickly. Do some, even better, a cannonball. Lands, stops. So with such primitive technology, how was it that Galileo was able to think of this without any electricity or magnets to show him this? So... That brings us to our next thing. A couple things he, he did. He, he did some what we call thought experiments. So here are two thought. You might be thinking, thought experiment? That sounds kind of silly. You do an experiment in your mind? Uh, actually, thought experiments, uh, from my memory, were uh, popular and important all the way up through Albert Einstein's work. Albert Einstein, we all know he's great. Did you know he didn't have any experiments other than his thought experiments in his mind that proved his stuff? And then later there were other experiments with equipment. But yeah, scientists sometimes think of an experiment in their mind and they come up with the physics from that. So here are some two experiments that Galileo sort of talked about and reasoned through. Here's the first one. He said, if you put a ball down a hill, it rolls and speeds up. Yeah, everyone would agree with that, right? If you launch a ball up a hill, while it's rolling up the hill, it's slowing down. Okay, what's between going uphill and going downhill? Flat. What's between speeding up and slowing down? And don't say staying at rest, okay? The other possibility is the velocity or speed neither going up or going down, but staying constant, okay? Rolls forever steady speed, unless there's something stopping it. And he said, okay, there's this friction, you know, which creates. So he figured that out. But without the friction, it'd go forever. Thought experiment one. The next thought experiment. If you take, he like ramps and rolling balls down a ramp. So you take a ramp like this, shaped kind of like a U, put a ball here, rolls down this ramp, goes across this little level part and goes up and he found and he showed that the ball pretty much returns to the same altitude, the same height, okay? And that's true, even if you lay this track down a little bit. Now people say, oh, well, if it went 10 centimeters here, then it's go 10 centimeters here, so now it'll go 10 centimeters here and stop over here. No, no. It went a longer distance because it had to get to the same height. And the more you put this track down, like in C, the further distance it went until it recovered that same height. So then Galileo said, what happens if I put the ramp all the way down? The ball will roll forever looking for that same altitude. I like that one. The second one, I think that's really kind of sweet and uh, interesting. So uh, I don't think I paused yet, so let me pause, give you a chance to jot these down. Okay, let's move on. So things stay at rest or they stay in motion. By the way, the stay at rest part, uh, I skipped over that, but Galileo didn't need to explain that. Even in the caveman age, right, when people are huddling around a little fire, you know, hungry because they didn't catch the, the mam mammoth that, uh, that day. So they're sitting there and they're, if, if at that moment, a rock 
levitated and flew out the front of the cave, even the caveman would know something is wrong. Objects that rest stay at rest unless I pick it up and throw it, right? So that part is not the radical part. It's the emotion part that's the ra radical part. But not all things do this equally, okay? So let me... Let me do my, maybe my own little thought experiment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this penny and I'm going to launch it at my stomach 50 miles an hour, okay? And that penny is going to want to stay in motion. So it's going to tunnel right through me and come out my back, right? No, watch this. Ah, abs of steel, right? <laughs> You're probably laughing saying, no, that's not abs of steel. You just did that with a penny. So it's like not much effect, right? And so it wants to stay in motion, but I was able to stop it. So different things have different tendency to stay in motion. For example, if I take this, steel kettle ball, 45 pounds. And maybe I can't launch that 50 miles an hour, but I shoot it out of a slingshot or something or, or a big giant catapult. Now that hits me 50 miles an hour in the stomach. Uh-oh, big problems, right? So why is it that the penny 50 miles an hour didn't kill me, but this 50 miles an hour would kill me? So obviously, things have a different tendency. Some things stay in motion with more effect or stay at rest with more sort of uh, uh, stubbornness, I guess we could say. So why? Well, What we need to do is understand that is to understand the concept of inertia. So inertia is this. It's the tendency of an object to stay at rest or to stay in motion. It's either, okay? I could get hit, hurt by this kettleball, this cannonball flying into me 50 miles an hour. Then it's gonna stay in motion and it's gonna keep staying in motion until my flesh is crushed. I could also hurt myself, not with the tendency of this to stay in motion, but the tendency of it to stay at rest. If you launch me out of a cannon 50 miles an hour, and the cannonball here is hanging and I fly into it 50 miles an hour. Now what's gonna hurt me is the tendency of this to stay at rest. And it'll create just as much damage staying at rest while I'm trying to fly through it as me staying at rest and it flies through me. So inertia is both. And so the more something has to stay at rest or in motion, we say this has more inertia and then the penny did. And why? Because the measure of inertia is the mass of something. So mass and the symbol for that is M in kilograms, okay? So if you haven't already, jot that down. But we also need to have a good solid grasp of what even mass is. And mass we talked about already all the way back in the force units. Okay, so back then I defined, defined force, I'm sorry, mass and weight. We have inertia, mass, and weight. And so what I'm going to do is rather than um, rewrite those, I want you to rewrite them in your notebook, but I'm a little lazy. So I don't know if you knew this, but this looks like a little remote control, but it's also a time machine. If I hit a button over here, it allows me to go back in time. So that's what I'm gonna do now. I'm gonna press this button and I'm gonna send you back in time to the day I talked about mass and, uh, 
and wait. And when you're there back in time, I want you to recopy those definitions into your notebook. So here we go. Brace yourself. Everything has mass and weight like this atom. The mass, first of all, is measured in kilograms. And what it is, is it's a measure of the amount of protons, which each have a mass of 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Neutrons, which also have a mass of 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And electrons, which have less mass given by 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms in an object. It's constant. It does not change with location. So for example, if I were to take this block of metal, okay, and I deconstruct it, not even atom by atom, but by particle by particle. So I pull out one electron, and then on my calculator I do 9.11 times 10 minus 31, plus, I pull out another electron, 9.11 times 10 minus 31, plus, and I do that over and over for a zillion years until I pull out every single electron out of this metal block. And then I move on to the protons and I pull out one proton and I add 1.67 10 to minus 27 kilograms instead of the 9.11 for the electron. And I do that for every proton. Take this apart. And now I have a bunch of neutrons. So I do that taking out each neutron and adding this every time. And Zillions of years later, um, I have no more metal block because I've taken it apart, and I hit equals on the calculator, and I would get 0.2 kilograms. Or I could look on the side and it says 0.2, right? So no one would measure the mass like that. Uh, we use scales and other things, technology, but that's really what it is. It's a measure of how much stuff makes up this block of metal. And if I take it apart, proton, electron, neutron, one at a time, here on Earth, I get 0.2 kilograms. If I go out into outer space, and I'm floating in the space station, and I take it apart, it still has the same number of protons, neutrons, electrons. I get 0.2 in outer space, too. Okay? No change in mass with location. It's the same. It's a constant. Does not change. Technically not true, but... That's Albert Einstein's theories that are kind of beyond the course. So for us, we're going to think of it as never changing. The weight, on the other hand, is measured in newtons, not kilograms, and it's a force. And what it is, is it's the gravitational pull a planet exerts on an object. And it changes when you leave the Earth. So this is about two newtons. If I take this to another planet, it's not going to be two, any, two newtons. Even though it's 0.2 kilograms on the other planet, still. On the other planet, there might be more gravity. There might be less gravity. Or maybe the same. Or maybe zero. So we're gonna... Okay, so we're back from several months ago. I hope you uh, didn't get dizzy by that journey. So uh, you have the definitions now in your notebook of um, mass and weight. And so now we know that when you're hit by something launched at you, you're not hurt by its weight, which a lot of people might say, oh, this cannonball hits you because of, it has a lot of weight. Or maybe you put me against a wall and the ship, the Titanic, comes and hits me, right? Then it really it, it crushes me. And why? Because it has more inertia than this penny. Why does it have more inertia, tendency to stay in motion, than the penny does? Because this penny has very few protons and neutrons. Well, it has a lot of protons, neutrons, and electrons, right? As we can't even imagine how many. But compared to the Titanic, whoa, that's got way more protons, neutrons, and electrons. So when it's going 60 miles an hour, well, it wouldn't go that fast, but when it's going, say, 20 miles an hour, and it hits me, it is going to be stubborn and stay in motion, stay in motion, stay in motion, stay in motion, and crush me because it's very hard to stop has a lot of inertia. It's also very hard to get it moving. If it's floating there and I go on the dock and I push with all my might, technically I'm moving it, you know? 
millionth of a centimeter by millionth of a cent, but it's, it's got an, a lot of inertia, sluggishness. So that's the concept. Newton's first law, everything stays at rest or in motion unless there's a force to take it out of rest or a force to take it out of motion, okay? And then different things stay at rest or in motion with different uh, uh, stubbornness. That's what we call inertia, which is just the mass measured by the mass. More mass, more inertia. Simple, okay? And then the last thing, I don't know uh, if our journey back in time had this equation, but on the homework you may need this. This is the relationship between mass and weight, okay? And so you may, and this would be 9.8. All right, so I hope you enjoyed our first uh, sort, of, uh, uh, sort of advance in our understanding of the universe, putting force and motion together. Today, Newton's first, what we call first law, Newton's first law thought of by Galileo. And uh, so tomorrow, or in the next video, we'll be talking about Newton's second law thought of by Isaac Newton. All right, I'll see you then. I'll see you in that video of Newton's second law.